Hello, everyone again. I'm Michelle, and I work on wild fisheries at the New England Aquarium. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lena, and I am also a wild fishery specialist at the New England Aquarium. Hello. Thanks for joining us again. I think the first week you heard a little bit about our backstories and how we came to be working at the aquarium. And um, today we are going to talk a little bit about what goes into our recommendations um, for wild fisheries. And in the first video, we talked a little bit about how our team works with the seafood industry to advance sustainable practices within wild capture and aquaculture fisheries. Um, and besides places like grocery stores and restaurants, the aquarium is another place that buys a lot of seafood um, to feed our animals and also to serve our guests. So in order to come up with our recommendations um, for wild fisheries, we look at different factors um, and consider the environmental responsibility of those factors. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we consider and how that applies to what we feed our animals. To compare different sources of seafood to each other, we use something called a decision ranking tool. And this is the same kind of thing we would use with our corporate partners. And you can use it to compare different kinds of seafood to each other or the same seafood just from different sources. And we use the tool um, to form buying recommendations and to locate areas in um, that source where they can improve in terms of their sustainability or responsibility. So even though the decision ranking tool looks really complicated, there's essentially a couple main areas that we focus on. And those are stock status, fisheries management, bycatch, and habitat impacts. And we'll also look at a few different things that aren't on the matrix, um, like the risk of harmful labor practices, impacts from climate change, and also our animals' preferences for what they want to eat. We are going to be focusing on squid, which is fed to many of our animals, including our seals and our sea turtles like myrtle and also our rescued sea turtles. And um, there are over 300 species of squid, but today we're only going to be talking about two of them that are found off the coast of Massachusetts, which is the short fin squid, Elixir sabrosus, and the long fin squid, Dorytethus palei. And the short fin squid is called short fin squid because its fin at the top goes straight into the mantle or the body. And the long fin squid sort of is longer and goes like that down to the mantle. The long fin squid is more commercially sought after because it actually keeps for longer and there's more of a um, market for it for human consumption. The short fin squid doesn't keep as long and um, there's a little bit less of a market. So usually when we say squid fishery, we're usually talking about the long fin squid. When we look at a population, we're looking at how many animals there are in there, what the makeup of that population is, how many adults breeding adults are there, how many juveniles or young ones there are, an overall estimate of how many there are in the population. So the way we look at stock status is um, mainly with two terms, overfished and overfishing. And a good way to think about these two terms is thinking about a bank account. So the goal is to keep your bank account at a level where you're not going to go broke, right? And it's the same for um, a fish population. So you want to keep that population at a level that which they can maintain the numbers and the different makeup of the population. If a stock is overfished, that means it has fallen below that level. A, one of the ways that it can fall below that level is from overfishing. So that's like when you're spending too much money and you're overdrawing from your bank account or you're spending at a level that's too fast, you might still be above the level that you need to be at to make payment for all your bills the next month, but you're you're spending at a rate that's too fast. So you could also be catching fish at a rate that's too fast or overfishing. <laughs> the squid fishery here um, is not overfished, which is great. Um, you mentioned wanting to be science-based, and so there is some science that is unknown with the squid when considering stock status, um, but all of the indicators that we can use point to the fact that it's healthy, which is um, positive.
like Michelle just said, one of the main goals when we're looking at stock status is we want to make sure that the populations um, of fish or squid that we're looking at aren't overfished and that overfishing isn't occurring. And one of the best ways of managing that, um, well, the way of managing that is having regulations and fisheries management plans in place to maintain those populations at levels that allow for fishing. Um, so some of the things that we look at is we want to make sure that fishing regulations, A, are in place, um, which in the U.S., fortunately, they usually are. <laughs> um, and then um, we want to make sure that those regulations are precautionary so that they can take into account some of those environmental fluctuations and changes um, that are taking place um, that could be affecting species and stocks. Um, and we also want to make sure that the fishery is being managed in a way that allows it to kind of continue on and be able to be sustained at a level, um, a healthy level over a long period of time, um, and hopefully a way that allows for continued fishing over time. Something else that we look for in fishery, fisheries management as well is if there's some kind of oversight happening. So we want to make sure that fishermen are being held accountable for following those rules. We also want to make sure that fisheries management um, is science-based and that a mix of stakeholders are involved in setting the rules and regulations. So obviously we want science to play a big role um, in kind of guiding where fishing limits are set, but we also want to make sure that um, fishermen are heard and are involved in that process. So some of the environmental impacts that we consider are the, the unintended consequences of fishing. So when you're fishing, you're trying to catch fish, but there's a whole bunch of other things that could happen, um, like catching things that you're not trying to catch or bycatch and impacting the habitat with the fishing gear. So according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, an estimate of the annual global discards from fishing in 2017 is about 9.1 million tons. That comes to about 10.1% of global annual catches. So 10% of what they're catching is something that they're not trying to catch and that they end up having to throw back. The survivability rate is variable, but it might not survive. Um, also 20 million endangered, threatened, or protected animals interact with fishing gear each year. Those are the animals that we're really trying to protect because there aren't that many left. If interacting with fishing gear is affecting their behavior that they need to survive, like feeding or mating, then that becomes a, a really big concern. Even though bycatch can have negative impacts, there are ways to mitigate it. Things like um, changing where you set your gear or what time of day based on the behavior of the species that you're trying to avoid tweaking the gear so that you're taking into account the way an animal will, will react to um, being startled by gear. So some animals can be startled up and some can be startled down. So if you if you have the gear, a, a net, for example, that's a little bit off the ground, you can avoid the species that startled down and just catch the ones that startle up. Depending on the type of gear, the bycatch will be different. So for squid, squid can be caught in a few different ways, but uh, the most common ways are trawling, which is a long net that's dragged behind the boat um, and weighted down and then with float rope to keep it open. And they can also be caught with dip nets or jigged for. This method takes into account some of the behaviors that squid have. So they come up to the surface at night to feed and they're attracted to light and shiny things. So they'll shine a light over the water and the squid are up there to feed and they just drop a line in it with lots of hooks on it. Um, and then they can catch a lot of squid at once. Just like different kinds of fishing gear have different impacts on bycatch species, different types of fishing gear also interact with habitat, which is usually we're talking about the bottom, the ocean floor. But also where you're fishing makes a big difference in terms of the kinds of habitat impacts that you're having. So if you're using a bottom trawl across a sandy or muddy environment, um, you might have relatively less impact on that environment than if you were trawling across, say, a coral reef um, or any kind of live bottom where there are a lot of different organisms that are forming structure and habitat.
Certain ecosystems will also take less time to recover after a disturbance like trawling than other more sensitive ecosystems, again, like a coral reef, which would take a very long time to recover after that kind of disturbance. When we're looking at impacts to habitat, we look at fishing gear type use, and we also look at where, um, where that fishing is occurring. And we can also try to limit those impacts by um, putting limits or regulations in place for the types of gear that can be used in some areas, or even closing certain areas to fishing altogether. So for example, with the squid fishery, um, along the East Coast and off the shore of Massachusetts, there are some really cool deep sea canyons that have really awesome deep sea corals, sponges, and they also are an area where cold water gets upwelled um, because of the shape of the canyon. So that brings up nutrients. So it's a really important source of food for a lot of commercial fish species. It's an important source of shelter for juvenile fish. And it's also an important foraging area for endangered, threatened, and protected species like sea turtles and whales. So since this area is so important and also has sensitive habitat like corals and sponges, we want to make sure that that area is protected from harmful kinds of fishing. To recap, our decision ranking tool considers stock status, the way the fishery is managed, the bycatch that might happen in the fishery, and the habitat impacts from the fishing gear. Also, some other factors that um, are really, really important for our animal care team that we don't look at in our matrix at all. Squid is something that animals would be finding in the wild, and we want to make sure that all the animals get as close a diet to what they would be getting. So squid is an important part of their diet in the wild, so squid should be an important part of their diet at the aquarium. We also have to take into account that animals like me and Michelle and many of you uh, have preferences about what they do and do not like to eat. Um, so sometimes we might suggest an alternative for um, something that our um, animal care team is feeding that might be a little bit better on our responsibility scale, but the seals might be like, no way am I eating that. It tastes gross. And we have to honor that choice. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today, and we hope you learned something. Next week will be our last and final video of this series for the Fisheries and Aquaculture team. So in the last video, we're going to be talking about things that you all can do to make more responsible seafood choices in your own lives. Um, and some other ways that aren't related to buying seafood there, where you can sell seafood generally and healthy oceans. Um, and if you have questions for us, um, we'd love to answer them in the last video. So you can leave them in the comments um, on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you.